Okay. We're going to be paying uh, between uh, him and uh, Lamb and Parsons. We're going to be paying like a hundred thousand a year. Mm -hmm. We're dead. I know that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I know. Like the last place person. Oh, yeah, I don't know. So I have to contact All right. Hello, Thanks. everybody. Um, chair, we appear to have a quorum. Yep. And that's 10 o'clock. So <clears throat> let's get started. Over to you to get us started. Yeah. Can we call the roll? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> All right. Chair Rogers. Here. Member Okrepti. Here. And Council Member Alvarez. Present. Represent that all three members are present. Perfect. We have no remote participations. We'll go to our announcements. Do I think of that? Yeah, we probably do. Let's do that. There we go. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, just a really quick but important announcement. So we have formally filled our Deputy Director of Economic Development with Andrew Scott Adair. Um, uh, Scott, I'll let him do a brief introduction, comes to us from Humboldt County, uh, quite a bit of economic development experience. Um, but before Scott does his introduction, I would like to publicly thank Jill Scott for her service. Over the last... well, you know, it's difficult with the acting assignments. It is a double duty of sorts, and Jill filled a lot of roles, um, did a fabulous job getting the strap plan up and running and, and creating a really solid foundation that I think Scott can step into and and, and really do amazing things. And I think it's also important to note that the people you see at the table are going to be the economic development team moving forward. Um, Jill in her real property role is still going to have a, a specific responsibility for economic development. Um, and this is going to show how we're gonna to partner together with various departments and divisions in the city to implement the goals that we're putting forward in the track. Um, so thank you, Jill, very much for your service. Um, and with that, Scott, if you'd like to do a brief introduction. Uh, yeah, just quickly, my name is Scott Adair. And so you know a little bit about who I am and some context as to where I'm coming from. Uh, I spent the last six years as the Economic Development Director for the County of Humboldt. I also, in that role, was the General Manager for the Humboldt County Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District. And I was also the executive director for the Humboldt County Workforce Development Board. In small counties, you wear all the hats. <laughs> um, so I was managing and overseeing a team which effectuated those three programs. And over my six year period of time with the county, brought in an additional $12 million in new revenues to the county, grew the team from three staff to nine staff. And grew the number of programs and initiatives by about 300% uh, that were supporting workers and businesses. Uh, prior to that, I came from private sector. I actually spent most of my career working for a number of real estate investment trusts uh, on the economic development side, and also a former business owner as well. Um, my partner and I, Shannon, uh, she and I own a coffee shop. And uh, so we've been entrepreneurs and, and we've done that. I'm just really excited to be here. Uh, I was really impressed by and, and drawn to Santa Rosa when I came down for a CALED event, uh, California Association for Local Economic Development. And uh, I think that event essentially is what recruited me here. Uh, I'm really excited about working with the team and Jill has been amazing already. And I anticipate we're gonna work really closely together. So, um, you're not being handed off. You're just being given an expanded larger team. <laughs> so thank you. Oh, thank you. I think first order of business is going to be to cancel allowing our staff to go to any conferences every <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's how recruitment happens. No, we're, we're really excited to have you. Uh, just for my colleagues, I have a, a good friend that works for the county of, of Humboldt who texted me how upset she was that you were leaving uh, to come here and how angry she was at me that Santa Rosa was able to recruit you oh, away, which I think is a very good sign <laughs> That's for That's a us. good sign. And I'm looking forward to working with you. Anything for my colleagues? Welcome. Yeah, thank you. We spoke earlier, but yeah, welcome. Thank you. And then let's see if there's any public comment. I don't see either of you. I'd like to add that he has been publicly endorsed by several people who work at our lead center, uh, SPDC as a lead center in Humboldt. Long history with him and said nothing but wonderful things. So. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Well, welcome. Thanks. Thank you. In the trial by fire, I'm sure we'll jump right into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have some minutes from July 9th. Do either of you have any amendments 
Anybody from the public have any amendments? Cool, we'll show those adopted. Uh, let's do public comment for non-agenda items. <laughs> no? All right, we'll keep moving. Let's go to item 6.1, our EIFD update. Thank you, Chair. Um, what we want to do this morning is just provide a very brief update on where we are with our enhanced infrastructure financing district. Um, the tax increment fi financing tool, or the TIF, is commonly called <coughs> the bill. I know there's been discussions in front of the subcommittee in the past regarding this process. Um, we have spun up our public financing authority to implement the EIFD. Uh, it's been a bit of a long road at this point, and I think anytime an EIFD incorporates both city and county, it has a tendency to be a longer road. Um, we were the first out of the gate, Sonoma County. Um, so as we started this process, the county as a whole adjusted from a policy standpoint to be able to handle inquiries from other jurisdictions. Um, but we've kept at it, and as we've gone through the PFA, there's been an ongoing conversation about projects and then tax increment commitments. Those are the two main components of the EIFD. Um, and in many ways, it's difficult. It becomes a discussion about the chicken or the egg. Which one do you decide first? Um, and there was quite a bit of conversation about the projects and understanding return on investment on those project categories to understand then the financial commitment that the county is willing to put into the mix. Um, and much of that conversation at the PFA was really about catalyst projects. Um, we, we presented concepts of beautification, <coughs> activation of public space, um, but really this concept of supporting that game-changing development in the downtown that just kickstarts that economic development and brings that activity in really dominated the conversations in, in front of the PFA. Um, now, the challenge with that is that project isn't really at the table. It gets to a lot of what Simon is doing at the Sears site. Um, so as we've evolved our project list, it's really that evolution has been around keeping broad categories, understanding how the EIFD can be nimble enough as these projects materialize, which are typically in most scenarios a public-private partnership of some sorts, how the EIFD can fund that catalyst project. Um, so we are having our next PFA meeting next Thursday, and there'll be more of a conversation about the project list and the tax commitment. Um, the county has committed to the EIFD to the tune of 25% of their tax increment and has supported our general project list categories, which are broad in nature. So we'll be working directly with the PFA, the council as a whole, to determine what that really looks like moving forward. Um, our strategy is to really move forward our infrastructure financing plan, that is the meat and potatoes of the EIFD, at the end of this year. Um, it goes through a public process and then it goes through a series of public hearings in front of the PF, PFA. It comes back to the council and the board of supervisors for final adoption, and it goes back then to the PFA for final adoption after that point. Um, that overall timeline, we think we can handle within this fiscal year, which that allows us to set this year as our base year. So any tax increment that's generated by reassessments through 420 Mendocino or the cannery project or anything else that takes place would then be incorporated. But that's really the important time. Uh, but that's a general summary. Happy to answer any questions about that. But as I said, more to come in the PFA meeting next week. Any questions? Hmm. No, I just want to thank you for keeping with it, Gabe. I know it's uh, been a little bit of a slog finding an agreement with some of the PFA members and with the county. It looks like we're at least at a, a good starting point. My question will continue to be, and, and I don't know if you want to answer it now or, Darielle, if you want to answer it now, is that 25% from the county, and depending on what we choose to do with the city, is, for lack of a better way to put it, is the juice worth the squeeze? Uh, is that enough revenue to really be catalytic in our downtown? Yeah, that's the analysis that we're conducting right now. But okay. that, that is the question right there. Yes. But we hope to have a little bit more uh, insight next Thursday. Um, but also, that will depend on what our commitment is to jurisdiction. So we've set the, uh, the placeholders at 50%. Um, to your point, us at 50%, the county at 25% is the juice worth the squeeze. Um, we should have a, a clear picture uh, after we get some information back from our consultant. I think if I remember correctly, our only real commitment to the, to the county in this whole process was that we would at least match them in our commitment, but likely do more. Is that correct? At least match them. And, and, and that aligns yeah, with the county's, yeah, yeah. the county's policy is that <clears throat> if they partner with the jurisdiction on the IFD, that that local jurisdiction has to match what the county contributes. If, 
percentage basis, not per dollar, dollar basis. basis. On a dollar basis. Yes. Okay. That's a good distinction. Thanks. Go to the public comment. I'm just going to keep looking over there until someone gets it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Uh, I don't have anything to add. All right, let's go to item 6.2. Uh, thank you for having me back to this committee again. It's nice to be able to report out to you today. I think everyone knows me, but for those of you who don't, I'm Kate Snickle Allenson. Um, I'm the executive director of the Downtown Action Organization, which is the nonprofit organization that runs the Downtown Community Benefit District. Um, our offices, we operate out of the chamber, but are separate from the chamber as an organization. Um, so I'm really happy to kind of provide you with some updates on downtown today. I'm going to just do a quick report out on downtown business changes, four street vacancies, projects and programs the GAO is working on, um, and a quick report from Next Street, which is our blue shirt team. Uh, if you want to hear anything else from me at future meetings, just let me know and I'll make sure to include it. Um, I want to start by... It's funny, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking, what did I used to report? It's been so long since I reported. So I pulled up a bunch of my notes from past ones and I always started with thank you to staff. And I was looking through who I was thanking and the projects and I was like, wow, this has been so consistent, how involved staff has been in downtown, how much staff, how much energy and time and um, attention staff have paid to downtown. And so I'm gonna just continue that again and say thank you to staff. We've made a lot of progress on issues Related to downtown, I'm really excited to welcome Meredith and Scott to the team um, and to kind of keep Jill in the fold more. I think we've got a lot of uh, momentum that we can keep going right now. So thank you to everybody. Um, quick updates. I think everyone has probably seen that unfortunately Towns has closed. Um, it's unfortunate we couldn't keep them going. We do have a new restaurant going into the Mary's space. Um, and then I don't know if everyone has been into Espresioso's Coffee yet. Um, it's a great couple running that little coffee shop, but they're all the way in the back of the building. Um, they do have a new vintage shop that they think is opening up there on um, October 1st. So excited to support them and kind of get that concept going. Right now on the three primary blocks of 4th Street, we have nine street level vacancies. Um, it doesn't include things that are in motion, but um, we're trying to kind of keep track of that as, as looking at our main uh, downtown street frontage. And then as with most city centers everywhere right now, office leasing is extremely slow in the downtown. And that's something you've heard from us a lot recently. Uh, some of the projects and programs we've been working on, um, circling back to something from quite a while ago, the Santa Rosa Now project that we started, all of those pieces are together. The website is live. We have the um, brochures. I actually have some with me if anyone wants more of them. Um, and we're looking forward to working with staff to kind of keeping that moving and, and getting the word out on that. And do you want to give a little context on what Santa Rosa now is? Yes. Um, anything that needs more context, I'm happy to provide. I think I just so used to talking about it, I'd probably skip over it. Um, Santa Rosa now was kind of a, a marketing effort that came together with the economic development team to um, promote Santa Rosa as a good place to start your business, to grow your business, um, to develop, to bring in new concepts. So it really focuses on the downtown area. Um, it talks about the benefits of being in the downtown, um, has some quotes and interviews from business owners in the downtown, and it really was meant to be you know, a very attractive visual piece that um, shows the benefits of Santa Rosa. So um, we haven't done the rollout of that yet, but we have all of the pieces and, and the information's live on the website. And then again, I've got some with me if anyone needs more. Um, so that was just kind of like a highly polished piece that we put together over about a year. Uh, Rose E, the trolley, Rose E, the trolley. Um, that program is nearing the end. We've got about three weeks left. So the DAO has been running that program since May. Um, huge thank you to the city for coming on as a supporter of that pilot to test it out with us. Um, we've gotten great feedback so far, good ridership data, um, I'm going to do a pretty thorough review of that whole program when it ends on September 29th. So possibly at the next meeting, I'll, I'll share a bit more detail on that. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, we'll have some, bring in some conversations with key stakeholders and look at what some potential options might be, whether it's looking for other partners to do a similar program, whether we don't recommend it, which I, I don't know if that'll be the case, um, but really being able to kind of take a, a full look at um, 
what that program did for the downtown area. Um, I'm not sure if everyone is aware right now, but like literally right now at this moment, the public works team is out putting up some um, baskets, some flower bag, well, planter baskets on the light poles in Courthouse Square. And that's thanks to a really great partnership with city staff over the last few months to kind of add some color um, and make Courthouse Square a bit more dynamic. And we've all heard after the reunification, lots of um, complaints about Courthouse Square being very bland, right? Which is really the intent was to have it be a, a gathering space and it's doing a great job serving that purpose. Um, so, so we've been working with city staff to get um, some color in through planters. We've got about 30 planters going in on our poles and about um, a dozen uh, pole banners going in. So the planters should be in in the next month. Um, and then the, the pole banners by the end of uh, by the end of the year. So we're just waiting for some supplies to um, come off back order for that. So that's a, a huge thank you to Dariel for pulling that group together um, and to Jason and his team for working through the install um, and the parks team and Zero for their help on that too. So that was a really all hands on, uh, on deck effort. So I'm excited that it's coming to the end. Um, I know Meredith, you're gonna talk about the fountain um, after the APPC meeting yesterday. Um, the DAO's role in this is really just to support um, the fountain being rebuilt by HFC. We did some fundraising back in 2019, um, 2020 maybe, uh, and raised about $130,000 to meet the need of that project at that point. I've not seen um, numbers yet around what it's gonna cost to rebuild. So uh, I don't know if additional funds will be needed or need to be secured for that to be built, but we're kind of preparing and and working through that now as we wait for that information. Um, the DAO just is gonna start working on some of our kind of consistent maintenance projects. We've got a number of planters that need to be replaced. Our trees are gonna have some maintenance done. Um, and then we're gonna work on some lighting upgrades as we head into the holidays. So those are all coming, that's all uh, downtown <coughs> infrastructure. Uh, and then next street, so next street is our, our blue shirts, we call them, they're kind of our, our downtown maintenance security um, and support team. Um, they work within the boundaries of the district and we have a really great tracking system that kind of shows us the stats. We can look at trends. Um, always trash pickup is the number one item. Um, usually first thing in the morning, they have quite a bit of trash to pick up, but one of the things we, and that's been consistent for the five years they've operated um, or we've had a team down here. It hasn't been next week full time. Um, but the other time consuming items for them right now are graffiti removal, which is huge, um, bulk items, and then cleaning of the infrastructure downtown, whether that's light poles, trash cans, picnic tables, um, that takes a, a lot of their time as well. Um, one thing that's probably worth noting and we'll be rolling out soon is that their phone number is gonna be changing. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out a, a better system to make sure that responses are, are going out to folks faster. Ideally, in an ideal world, this team is, is fully proactive and they're taking care of everything before it even comes to um, the attention of the property owners within the district. But the reality is right now they are very reactive. So we rely on people to report instances of graffiti, to send in photos of trash cans that have been rummaged through, um, send pictures of things that the team can help with. And so we're trying to kind of streamline the process of, of that information coming in. So that's why we're getting a new number. That'll go out in the downtown newsletter. If anyone's not getting the downtown newsletter, let me know and I'll add you to that list. Um, and then we're going to be sending out cards. Um, right now, all the business owners have important phone number cards that have in response, next street, um, SRPD for non-emergency issues, and to remind them when an issue might actually be an emergency, which surprisingly is needed. Um, so we'll be updating everyone on that once we have the number that's coming. But... Um, in the meantime, that thing is working really hard. We generally get pretty good feedback on them and just encourage folks to reach out and help kind of be part of that solution. When you see something that needs attention downtown, you can text a picture. You don't even have to say anything. Um, they generally know what it is. That is. Um, I will leave it there unless there's any questions. No, I just want to start by thanking you for the partnership. Uh, it is noticeable how different downtown is than it was a couple of years ago. And I think that that's largely based on the efforts of so many people, including in this room, to make it a more welcoming community. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the planters. Uh, I think that will actually uh, 
do a lot uh, for downtown as well for the ambiance. But colleagues, <clears throat> no. I, um, also, just uh, thank you for the efforts with Rosie um, Rose E. Uh, the trolley. Um, Having been able to write it, it's not only fun, but it's convenient. And uh, I look forward to seeing the data on that. I just put my phone to, to bring Ellis on it before it's done. <laughs> so. uh, for myself, just really pleasantly. Actually, I'm really, I'm really grateful for the way that, that, that businesses have been responding to it in regards to graduate I know there was an instance, uh, two incidents that was reported to me, and within the day it was taken care of. So I'm very appreciative of the response time. Yeah, I just I wanted to swap on that really quickly because we really try to address the graffiti as quickly as possible. We don't put our team in in risk, and obviously some of these graffiti artists have are incredibly nimble. But um, our team doesn't clean anything over fourteen feet, mm -hmm. and their preference is always to paint it. So if you hear from a property owner who's complaining, one contact Next Street, two give paint to Next Street because it's so much faster and it looks better when they can reapply paint rather than try to use graffiti removal to get it on. So. I do have a question in regards to the vacancy. I hear a lot of conversations, have a lot of conversations in regards to what can we do to solve the vacancy problem that, that is really affecting the nation, that no longer are people using offices as, as they used to. Uh, are there any ideas that coming from the DAO in regards to that issue? Any yeah. other conversations that you've been having? I think a lot of what we've been talking about yeah. is also, are also things that Gabe and his team are. Yeah, and I know we're going to talk forward. about that shortly as well. Um, so I'll, I will defer to them, but right now, um, I think what we're seeing is is the the property owners looking to to do something different. Maybe it's shifting uh, the use of their space, making it easier for them to shift the use of their space um, and get their TIs done quickly, so that they can get people in um, and get new business owners up and running quickly, so that their capital is. Well, appreciate that. If I may. Uh... An event that I'm looking forward to is Fall Festival. Um, so if you wanted to say a quick word, Fall Festival, and what we have to look forward to. Sure. Um, I was, uh, I, I didn't ask until yesterday, so it's my fault, but I was trying to get a report from the Chamber team on all the events that they've been, uh, they've been managing in the downtown. And Fall Fun Fest um, is a very fun one. We started it in 20. 21, I think, um, and have just had thousands of families come out every year. Chris has served as a judge in the costume contest for many years, usually in his own costume, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, it is the most fun. It, it is, like it's, it. it's a great event. Um, it starts with uh, trick-or-treating at the businesses on 4th Street and throughout downtown. So we, we really try to encourage our business owners to stay open, meet some new customers. Uh, you know, families are pretty much everyone's customers. So um, it's a great opportunity to connect with them and hand out candy and, and, and meet, meet our residents here in Santa Rosa. Um, and then we have, um, there's tons of games, incredible amount of candy uh, and sugar for the kids, um, and then other fun activities. I think there's a balloon twister and, and a face painter. Um, so costume contest, all of that. There should be some rides as well. I don't think there's going to be a Ferris wheel this year, which is a bummer, but um, I know there's going to be lots of other things for the for the kids to do. Um, and then Wednesday Night Market is also doing Wednesday Night Markets on either side of that. So it's going to be Wednesday, Friday, Wednesday of fall-themed events um, in the downtown. So if you are someone who loves the spooky season, you can just camp out downtown in October and you'll be, you'll be covered. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, Fall Fun Fest is so responsible for my favorite complaint I've ever gotten on city council, which was the Ferris wheel <clears throat> and getting a very angry email from somebody that small towns don't have Ferris wheels and we're a small town. So why are we having a Ferris wheel? This <laughs> <way>? <laughs> Never <laughs> no, oh. no. But it, it was it was absolutely my favorite and it is a fun time. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it again this year. And maybe I'll get to judge the cost. <laughs> no, no, no. Do we have any public comment? Nope. All right. Go on. Thank you. <clears throat> really great to have you here. Let's go back. Uh, <clears throat> I just point three. All right, Chair and Council members, thank you very much. I'm going to, for item 6.3, just be giving an overview of the current um, economic conditions. And we're going to start with interest rates. I know that interest rates are something that everyone watches very closely. Uh, I put a cost or an interest rate comparison up here in this presentation for you so that we can track the movement of interest rates. 
since the pandemic. Uh, as most of you are aware, the Fed offered some relief during the pandemic uh, by lowering those rates. Presently, interest rates, prime is at an all-time high, uh, although you may have heard that the Federal Reserve Chair at their recent annual meeting in Wyoming hinted at potential reduction in rates. There was a subsequent market of recovery uh, in response to that announcement, uh, followed by the next week by um, a market downturn. So a lot of that is attributed to what economists refer to as the vibe economy, uh, or essentially consumer confidence right now is, um, is varying to different degrees depending on how things are happening in the economy. And interest rates is one thing that's affecting both consumers and business owners. How does uh, prime affect business owners? Well, uh, the prime rate, and this is difficult to see on the screen, but it is attached in your agenda, directly affects the borrowing rate that small businesses can borrow from and other businesses can borrow at. Uh, the SBA 7A loan program, which is one of the more common loan programs offered by SBA for small businesses uh, because of current rates, uh, where Prime sits at now is uh, between 13 and 16 and a half percent for small businesses to borrow right now, uh, which is a huge barrier to entry uh, for entrepreneurs, especially those who are looking to start new businesses in this economic climate. This is also affecting uh, other loans uh, for businesses, credit loans for businesses, consolidation of debt, in addition to SBA loans, uh, merchant advances for small businesses are all being impacted. <clears throat> there are some sub-market prime uh, rates that are available, but even those sub-market prime rates are still much higher than where they were during the pandemic. Um, so this is something to take into consideration that borrowing at this time, uh, the procurement of capital for small businesses is very difficult. And we will go into um, the future or at the um, six point, I think, 6.6 it is, we're gonna talk a little bit about KPI, key performance indicator tracking, and what type of metrics uh, we should be bringing to you on a regular basis. But these are just some slides I wanted to put together so that you have an understanding of the current business climate. Uh, wanted to provide also a labor update for you. Uh, I have found that the state's employment development department, the EDD team, uh, is one of the best sources of information for this. They have several full-time staff who track uh, and share labor market data for different regions. I did include in this analysis uh, or this snapshot of current conditions for you, the county uh, current rates, as well as the rates for Roner Park and Windsor, so that you can get a feel for where Santa Rosa currently sits. Uh, this is tracking unemployment, which is currently at 4.6%, something that we can consider tracking in the future, uh, which would also be labor force participation rate. Uh, that's another key indicator for what the labor market's doing. Not a lot of entities track that. Usually they focus on unemployment, uh, but it's also important to understand which percentage of the workable labor force is actually working. We can bring that back in the future to you. Uh, you can see that Rotor Park is at 4.6, Windsor is at 4.3, and Sonoma County is currently resting at 4.4% unemployment. And these numbers are as of July. So with economic data, we're always looking in the review mirror. Um, I thought it would be interesting for our ongoing labor updates to start talking about and sharing information regarding top employers uh, in the city. This is information that comes from essentially census data. Uh, there could be top employers here who are missing. The industry typically tracks these employers in a range of employee size uh, from a thousand to just under 5,000 employees being um, at the max. And you can see that we're tracking anything down from 250 to 499 employees. Uh, interestingly enough for um, SBA, a small business is considered to be anything with under 500 employees, uh, which is still a sizable employer. And so as part of our business retention and expansion program, which will be rolled out in conjunction with implementation of the Economic Development Strategic Plan. 
we will be developing uh, a model for regular outreach uh, with these large area or these large employers in the area and tracking those activities and, and bringing those updates and activities to you. And this is, um, I didn't see wage tracking in prior uh, presentations, but I thought this might also be something that uh, your committee might be interested in. We can actually get very granular with this and we can go by industry type or sub-industry type, but this is just the aggregate of all occupations currently in, in the uh, market uh, and what the mean hourly wage is, which is just under $35 per hour, that equates to about $72,000 annually uh, in salary. And then a um, uh, standard for the 25 or the 25th, 50th, and 75th um, ratios for what those, how those wages break down. And again, we can add different occupation types or if there are target industries or sectors that you're interested in seeing more data on, we can bring that to you. Um, working with CoStar on analyzing vacancy rates for the market, this is something that Jill and I talked about extensively and I imagine we'll be working with Cadence and DAO regularly moving forward, especially for vacancy in the downtown. I know in the past you were provided with some graphical representation uh, in the form of charts as to where vacancy is currently going. Um, I took that data and I charted it out using um, CoStar information, which just for context, CoStar uh, is a real estate tracking tool, uh, data analysis tool, and also a listing service. And it's considered to be uh, one of the premier commercial real estate listing data analysis tools that, that exists out there in the market. Uh, and you can see that presently, um, as was indicated by Cadence, that um, we do have in the office inventory category um, quite a bit of vacancy. And there, there, even though there has been some positive absorption, uh, absorption essentially just means that there has been some additional space which has been leased in the market, uh, but there's still quite a bit of vacancy that does exist. Um, and again, we'll go through, we have the discussion around key performance indicators. If there's more specific data that you want to see, this just tracks uh, the current inventory that does exist as well as what the market rates are for that inventory type. You're seeing industrial, office, and retail in that uh, order. And next time I'll make sure that we um, notate that on the slide. Any questions about um, any of the data that was presented on interest rates or vacancy rates currently or labor market information? Well, for myself on, on, the, on the one on labor, I would like to see the numbers on, on technology uh opposed to manufacturing for for a city being that just keep an eye on, on our on our highest producers like see labor data on the tech, tech the sector the, on the tech sector but specifically yeah i just say this is great information to have um i mean this is meat and potatoes of what this committee is here for um so i just appreciate you bringing this all forward um uh, yeah, keeping this all up to date um, on a regular basis would be extremely valuable as we talk about how we want to proceed forward and, you know, we'll get into the KPIs later. Um, uh, yeah, I just appreciate you putting this together. Yeah, yeah and I'll, I'll echo that. Um, I think also providing some of the why is always really helpful. So like your explanation about why it matters for interest rates, I think is really helpful for the public to better understand not just why we're tracking data, but how best to use that data. Um, so that's really helpful. I just appreciate it. Great. Thank you. I, it, it was very quick, sort of a gloss over of those um, data points, but I figured the more we meet, the, the more staff will better understand uh, how you want that data reported to you and the types of things that you're looking for. I definitely agree on adding a little bit of why and maybe a little narrative as to um, what those indicators are telling us about the, the market and maybe some projections. Yeah. But it, and I think also it's helpful. A lot of this is out of our control, really. Like interest rates, we can't control interest rates for the right. city. And so making sure that we're talking about which variables or which levers we can pull right. and how broader 
national and global trends are impacting our local business, um, I think it's super helpful. Any public comments? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I'll go on to 6.4. Thank you. I'm Meredith Knudsen, the Arts and Culture Coordinator. Um, so today I'll be talking about the Asawa Fountain update. Um, the way I see this project is it's split into two projects. We have the building of the base fountain, um, and then we have the Asawa panels and the repouring of that. Uh, do you want to maybe do the next slide? Absolutely. So, um, yesterday, um, Hugh Futrell and I went to APPC to present um, a project update um, as a discussion points um, on the rebuilding of the fountain. Um, two of the discussion items were the tile color and um, possible concrete color, actually along with the plaque. Um, his goal is to um, start to construct the fountain end of this year um, and beginning of next year. Currently, um, the next steps for this will be the submittal of the plans um, and the project timeline. Next slide, please. So yesterday we brought the tile colors to APPC. Um, one of their concerns was they didn't want it to look too much like a pool um, with the tile colors. And Hugh made some great points on um, the way the sun is, is it's bright in the sun, there isn't too much shade there. Um, and we were hoping to have the tile color, the tiles in front of us, but he couldn't get them in time. So these were the slides that we looked at. Uh, from these, these slides, uh, they enjoyed lighthouse and bay waves most. Um, their concern with Enchanted was thought it would be too bright. Um, and again, would look too much uh, like a pool. And then next slide. So for the, for the base fountain, Hugh's getting back to me with the project timeline and the plans. Um, that's the next steps for that. Um, and then we can move through um, to hopefully get that started construction end of this year. Um, the next part of the project is the Asawa panels. Uh, so as you know, when the uh, fountain was uh, deconstructed, we had to put the panels in um, storage, uh, which are currently in storage in Oakland. And um, it was determined after a consultant looked at the panels that we could not um, reattach these to the new fountain. So it would have to be um, recasted. The, re the panels were originally meant to be in bronze. And so the 300,000 from pg e settlement funds was set aside so we could repour these panels in bronze. Um, we've contracted with Artworks Foundry and I have a meeting with them tomorrow. Um, so I can understand their process and timeline being new to this project. Um, it is known that we have to pour these panels after the fountain is built because we don't want um, any little error on the measurements of this. So tomorrow I'll get some more information on what their process looks like, what's the timeline of that um, once the fountain is built uh, to install those. And I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm really excited. I, you know, we did talk about when we mm -hmm. developed a square that it'd be a blank slate that we would add to over time. And this was a, a signature piece. This is a reminder for folks. It'll be on the south side. Of, correct. South side of the square yeah. where Santa Rosa Avenue and Third Street intersect, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Um, cautiously optimi optimistic about this. I mean, I think this is the Third time I've heard it's going to be done in the next three to four months. So um, I said optimistic. I, 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 I've been going through the files on this on this long project, so I completely understand. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have we had discussions with um, the Wednesday Night Market Board about the this being put in and what it does to their stage that they it, they use on a regular basis? Because I believe this is right where they put their stage. Um, I'm not aware that we've had those conversations. Um, I know this was in the plans for when the square was mm -hmm. unified. Um, so I don't know if that was a conversation already had or or if it's um, a possible conversation we can have now with moving forward with it. So Yeah, I think it'd be better to get in front of it than have it be a reactionary thing um, and just kind of let the board, their board know like, hey, this is expected to be in January mm -hmm. in place. So start planning where else they could put it. I made mean, there that we yeah. we've had some conversations okay. with them and we have a meeting, all of us have a meeting with them about the upcoming year for Wednesday night market and what it looks like and what the yes. expansion looks like. And a big part of the conversation is the fountain. Okay, great. Okay. And if I may, I'll do uh I said it in jest, but you're absolutely right. Um this has been a conversation since I've been in the city and it's I'm, I've been here over two years now. Um and so I share your urgency. 
to get this project over the finish line. And so I just want to go on the record saying that this is a priority of ours, um, that we are going to see this through and we're going to get this done. Um, Kate, did you had mentioned uh, there may be some possible fundraising that needs to happen. We're waiting on some bids to come back. Um, my concern there is how, how does that impact the timeline? So I, I don't have the answer to that yet. Um, if we're talking about, you know, a gap of you know, $10,000, $20,000, that doesn't seem insurmountable. If we're talking about something over a hundred, it will likely delay the timeline. But I don't, I don't know what that is yet. Right, right. Um, do, do we have an idea um, when we expect to see some of those those projections. I hope this week. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, yeah and I, I, I've been hearing that it's coming back for the eight years that I've been on council also, <laughs> so I, I get the frustration. Um, I do want to say, though, we wouldn't be at this point if it weren't for people like Hugh Fattrell right. and others who have been working really hard on it, so I do want to acknowledge their contributions, um, especially keeping the ball moving forward to get to this point. Uh, but I, like you, I'm anxious to see it completely. Yeah, and, and the only reason why I, I wanted to put a point on that was because of what Caden said earlier and Chris just said during this item, which was um, Chris said it nicer. Caden um, said it more direct uh, where people said this is blank and we get we get, we get complaints, frankly, mm -hmm. that there's not enough on the square. Um, you get complaints? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, that was one of the things that when they first did this, when we were taking down the trees and, mm -hmm. you know, it was like, no, but we're going to do all these things. And the fountain's going to come back and it's going to be great. And I just want to be able to deliver on those mm -hmm. um, uh, promises that previous councils had made. Any? Well, I was going to say, I don't know if it was a coincidence, but I wanted to share that on social media, I've definitely seen an uptick in conversations about how nostalgic, you know, people are feeling about not seeing the, the fountain and yet how, what a great addition it would be if we brought the fountain back. So it's great that we're having these conversations. I know that, that the fountain is definitely a conversation piece within the community. Yeah. Every time I uh, ask the city manager, when can we tell people it's coming back? <laughs> she uh, she tempers it. She says, you know, just wait till we have a concrete, right. mm -hmm. unintended de deadline. And, and I don't know, but also, but it's not going to look like a like a like a bathtub. As one of the comments <laughs> was, well, will that be the public bath uh, shower? <laughs> so, but it was so the public pool. You know, or, yeah, or we're, not, we're not we're not over here. Yeah. Or or, or <laughs> on, on, on a corner square, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's good to see. Go any, any comments from the public? All right, let's go ahead and go to item 6.5. Thank you. So today I'll be presenting a um, an events update, um, not only an events overview, um, but regarding our uh, event support funding that we have for SRTBIA and community promotions. Next slide. Thanks. Um, so for this year, for um, SRTBA and community promotions funding, um, the applications are closing um, this week on September 12th, um, and they opened up in August. Um, there's the two different pools of funding. There's for the community events and then the destination building events. And that's what we really want to um, ensure we highlighted this year is how are our people bringing in heads and beds um, into Santa Rosa and how are we um, destination marketing um, city of Santa Rosa? Um, and so... This year, uh, we decided to put some funding into um, our marketing outreach plan. Um, and we use uh, different target areas. So Los Angeles, Portland, Seattle, Austin, and also still Sonoma County. Um, we haven't done this before. So what we wanted to do is just start with a baseline so that next year we can start to understand where our target market's at, where, how is the open rate? Is this a success or did it fail? Um, we put $50 to start um, on each one and then end up 100 So not much of an investment um, for what you can see um, as a really great post engagement. Um, and um, these two cents per engagement and, um, and the post, let's see, sorry, I don't have the thing in front of me. So with the post engagements, and I think LA was one of the top hitters. So um, this is a really great turnout uh, for our marketing ads. We did two different ads. Um, we did a little bit of a longer video um, highlighting our destination events um, and a really short, thank you, um, three second video of click here to apply for event funding. Um, so I hope that next year we can pull this data um, and, and grow it. 
Um, another thing that you can do with Facebook and social media is you can do targeted outreach. So anyone that was an event manager, an event planner, an event organizer had that as their interest or had that as their job, um, that's who we promoted this to. So it was a very targeted audience for this. So I'm very happy with the success. Um, I'm hoping we can get a couple applicants. And if not through this, we still got on their radar as Santa Rosa as a destination event building. And uh, for the next slide, we have um, a, just a list of the upcoming events. Um, as Cadence was mentioning, we have the Fall Fun Fest in October. We have the Harvest Art and Wine Festival by GAMS. So a lot of really great um, upcoming events here for the city of Santa Rosa. Um, at the next meeting, I'd be more than happy to go over um, the events that are going to be funded through SRTBIA and Community Promotions, since that's closing this week. Um, so what's up and coming uh, for next year? Great. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to do the uh, downtown underground tour and see the, the clown graffiti, uh, it is a quintessential Santa Rosa experience. So I would highly recommend it to folks who haven't done it yet. Comments from colleagues? Already on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to know how many of these events we'll see Eddie at. I think the answer is almost all of them. I was just thinking, do I have time? I hope I have time. The 15th, I'm not happy with it. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, the, 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 the hall of flowers, right? <laughs> well, I, was, I was thinking about the independence one, but also the hall of flowers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I the hall of flowers, I might not make it to the other one. Those are the two that I had. I'd go to 100 mile away, right? So definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to public comment. No comments? All right, we'll bring it back. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah. How about Adam 6.6? .6? Uh, all right, chairs. I'm excited to have this conversation. Uh, there's an old adage that goes something to the effect of what gets measured gets done. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're bringing relevant information to you, but we don't want to be just bringing information for the sake of bringing information. Uh, we also want to have a discussion around how in depth we want to go. The earlier presentation on interest rates and, and labor market information, well, I could have spent half an hour, an hour. I mean, we really could dive into those types of things. But is that the type of data that you want to dive into? So the discussion that we're going to have today is going to help shape these future discussions and these future presentations on data. We're going to talk about the type of data that you would like to see, what that data is going to be relevant to. My suggestion, although this is just a discussion item, there's no hard and fast staff recommendation attached to it, is that we can look at current snapshot, sort of these are current conditions, somewhat of a dashboard as to where we're at. We can identify what type of things you want on that dashboard, but that we also look at data which is relevant to council's strategies. And I know that council has a specific strategic plan that includes some considerations for economic development. We can bring data points back which are relevant to that plan, and also data points back which are relevant to the implementation of the economic development strategic plan, so that as we're looking to effectuate and implement all these strategies, we're tracking the outcomes and the deliverables and the data which informs that. There are a number of different types of economic data that we can look at from labor market information or LMI, uh, to business-related data, looking at consumer data as well, um, how consumers are feeling about the, the current market and those conditions, et cetera. And there are other non-traditional uh, data points that other economists and communities are also starting to track, uh, which are more relevant to quality of life and neighborhood confidence, et cetera. And these are all metrics that we can, we can um, explore bringing together and bringing back to you. There are some examples of these data points um, that are included in your presentation uh, or in your agenda packet, labor market information, uh, unemployment I covered uh, previously, and I included a little bit of wage data. We can also include labor force participation rates. We can start breaking into employment data by industry, including wage data uh, and participation by industry. We can start bringing back potential projections for you so that you can start identifying trends uh, as to where, um, uh, where careers are moving in the market. 
some of the more common consumer indicators include CPI, which is the consumer price index. There's also a savings indicator that a lot of economists like to track, uh, which tells you the, the savings behaviors of individuals and whether individuals, consumers are saving more presently or they're not saving more presently. Um, uh, anything regarding cost of living, housing, uh, is a big one typically that councils like to track. They want to understand how the cost of regular goods and services are impacting consumers, uh, utility rates, fuel rates, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, Gabe and I have also talked about um, permit activity tracking what some of the um, activity on the planning side looks like. That can give us a little bit of an indicator as to what's happening <laughs> in the business market. Uh, from new business startups, uh, business expansions. Those are types of things that we can bring back to you. Uh, tracking market vacancy. You know, I threw a slide up earlier with some you know, square footages and some market rates, but what does that mean? And, and where do you want staff to take that for you in terms of, as you indicated, Chair, the why and what that potentially means as far as impacts to the community? Um, and then, of course, going back to some of just the general community economic indicators, uh, understanding what our private to public investment ratios look like in the community. Some communities track very um, uh, specifically uh, what any of the public infrastructure ongoing um, liabilities or obligations are, um, what that ratio is compared to a private development in that particular site. Uh, some communities chase after a certain, you know, 20 to 1 up to a 40 to 1 ratio. Um, and for some councils, that's not important to them. So I think that really what I was hoping to hear from you, uh, so that the type of presentation that was done earlier um, can be very uh, effective and meaningful to what it is that councils try to achieve and in those two guiding documents, council strategic document, the strat plan for economic development, uh, the types of information that you'd like to see. Also bearing in mind that we can rotate it too, right? We can have a conversation with a focus on the tech industry. Uh, we can do it by industry sector. We don't necessarily just have to bring you a big pile of data every time we meet. So would love to hear your thoughts and get your feedback. And then from that feedback, uh, staff will work to put together a bit of a work plan around those data points and what the delivery of that data could look like. I think ultimately having information allows us to make the best decision possible. Uh, so definitely knowledge is power. And although no longer with us on council, I know that uh, Tom Shorthand, you know, or the, the, word, for me. <laughs> the word metric and the amount of information that would, would just put a smile on his face. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's it's almost a process of, of elimination. Uh, <clears throat> throw it at us, and then depending on what the subject matter is, uh, you in your in your in your role could provide us what you think was best, what information best serves us to help us make the best decision possible. Yeah, I would. Uh, I'd echo that. Uh, Thomas Schwedhelm is the predecessor for the district I represent, um, and. To Eddie's point, it was always, how are you going to measure that? How are, you, how is, how are we going to know that this is successful? And, um, you know, when I was a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed candidate, he was, I was like, we should do this. He's like, how are you going to measure that? <laughs> Who's going to do it? I was like, oh, okay. Um, and it, it, just being a realist, so I think this is great information. Um, the labor market and business economic indicators, I think, are huge. The consumer economic indicators, um, median home price, I mean, how expensive it is to live here. I mean, we all know how expensive it is to live here. I, it's, it's, you know, it's not like are, are, are we above or below a certain other, it's like, there's very few that we're below. Uh, we know how expensive it is. Um, I think um, when you talk about housing issues, we, we are so mired in housing policy and efforts. We get that information from multiple places. Um, it doesn't hurt to have it, but I don't think you need to spend a ton of time on it. Cause I think, I mean, I think, Megan and Jill with combined with housing and, and commercial space could easily supply a lot of this information. Um, uh, on, on, uh, so um, yeah, I'd say the business economic indicators and, and definitely the labor market information would probably be my, uh, as well as the uh, public private um, investment ratios would be um, the top levels for me. 
Yeah, I'm going to go about it actually a little bit different. Um, I What I'd like to see is a recommendation on what the key uh, data for us to, to track or indicators relative to our economic development strategic plan that we passed. Mm -hmm. Walking through those elements and making a recommendation about how best to measure whether we're achieving the goal of this strategic plan that we spent years developing. Um, so it's not just one sort of blanket thing for across the whole city, some of it might be the case, but really digging in and saying, okay, so for item one, here are our key measures, and then reporting out from time to time, how are we actually doing about achieving that, that plan? Um, to your point about if you're not tracking, it's not getting done, or you know, things that get done and get tracked, uh, I, I don't want it to just be another plan that sits on the shelf that sounded really good, but actually our ability to say to the public, we had these discussions, we had this plan, here's our data to back it up, and here's the impact that we're having. Yeah, I agree. So it, it sounds like, from what I'm hearing, that a general economic snapshot of general conditions is still something that you're very interested in receiving. And through process of elimination, if we decide we don't want that data, we want this data, we can work that out. Focusing on business um, data, LMI, um, some of those other public-private development ratios, but also we as staff could bring back some recommendations, um, the type of data and program deliverables to start tracking as it relates to the economic development strategic plan. And I'm forgetting the name of the other, the council plan. Council work plan. Yeah, I, I think in general, it, it's always helpful to tie things back to the council's goals mm -hmm. uh, and strategic plans, and not just because we've had those discussions, but also it keeps council accountable as well. Uh, we ask staff to do a lot of things that we don't actually set as city goals and so don't set resources for. Mm -hmm. And so it holds us accountable to making sure that we're being very diligent in keeping our eye on the prize. Yeah, if I can, sure. Uh, after hearing my colleagues speak, I, I and also mention the word lens, what lens we're actually using to look at this information. Mm -hmm. And for myself, uh, I think I, I, I implore the equality lens, mm -hmm. not so much the equity, but the quality lens of how we're actually looking at, at the human development quality, whether it's the, the waste data, the data that you can present to us. Uh, and uh, just a little end cap, uh, I also simply quoted Tom Schwethelm, a former council member. I will also quote our, our former city manager. Uh, we also understand you're not a research institution. So making sure that we're cognizant of how much work it is for you to pull the, together the data that may or may not be helpful. <laughs> just, just saying. You know, he's also here. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, one more question which would be helpful for staff. Um, are there certain target industry sectors or clusters that you're really interested in um, receiving information on or uh, updates on at this point presently? Um, uh, Council Member Alvarez mentioned technology. Uh, there are others that we can also look at. We can also stagger them, bring them in, you know, different updates or presentations at different times. Yeah, I mean, I think health is a big one yeah. for our community. That's, yeah. No, I, I agree. Some might call it a healthy economy. <laughs> and that, we'll go to public, public comments. <laughs> any, any comments? That was a good Someone. attempt at a joke. I'm gonna have to break out my uh, my medical times, and I do have a list of them. <laughs> All right, I'll bring it back. <laughs> so, uh, Chair, that concludes the presentation of materials on the new business items, um, and so I think that takes us back to. Uh, matters held in committee and then department reports. And I don't think we have any matters held in committee, so let's go to the department reports. Thanks. Just very quickly on the department side, um, what you're seeing is we're filling vacancies in positions. So um, we have one vacancy left, and that's the administrative analyst position in our economic development section that was granted through the budgetary process, and we're in the process of recruiting for that. And then once that position is filled, the team is full go, um, and the train is on the tracks, and we're moving. 
And I think what you'll hear in the next few meetings, there'll be a lot of discussions about the foundational elements and really that battle rhythm that, that you're looking for as far as meeting to meeting. Um, and the data gathering request is an important piece to that. Um, but I think at some point we're going to be incredibly aggressive in our approach. And I think it's easy to say with interest rates and a lot of the functions that we don't control as a local jurisdiction, it's very easy to be complacent to say we don't control that, but there are credit ways to mitigate that. And I think as the team starts hunting and digging a little further to understand those creative approaches, you'll start to see that linkage to the strap plan from an implementation strategy standpoint. And I really appreciate the discussion about measuring the effectiveness of that implementation strategy. We tried to bake that into the strap plan and bring things forward that we could actually measure, because I think that's a really important point moving forward to show those levels of successes. Um, I think from an equity balance standpoint, it's also really important to the conversation often gets to downtown really for good reasons. Um, but what are we doing in some of our more unique business centers? Roseland, for example, how is it functioning in Cottingtown? What is Montgomery Village doing? So we'll have more of an equity discussion about how commercial activity is happening through the city. And those are all uniquely different areas with uniquely different issues. So we'll bring in some of the permitting aspect. You'll see how the department is really rallying around this being council's number one priority. Um, you'll see bigger teams here from time to time. Um, so really appreciate the feedback. If there's anything else that we're missing from the agenda items that will evolve in the future for the next meeting, we're happy to hear about that now. Uh, but you will start hearing more about specific strategies. We're starting to uncover some of those in the discussions, but it'll be more of a define that the staff is actually working on this program. will help us frame that program and we'll look at a timeline for anything. Um, so that's sort of where we are in the process, but happy to hear any additional items for future agendas that the committee Thoughts? No, I think it's great. I think that uh, especially important on different areas of the city centers and how they operate individually and how it actually comes together as a whole to make centers a better place, I think is actually imperative, especially on the border we're sitting on. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, it's always funny when someone talks about economic development in the city of Santa Rosa and no offense, the downtown and railroad square get brought up immediately. Um, and it's like, well, what are you going to do here? And what are you going to do here? And, you know, Eddie and I live in parts of the city that are very far from it. And um, so, you know, and, but we have industrial space, we have commercial space that can be taken up. Uh, so um, I, I, yeah, I think that lens of, of spreading it out through the entire city. I mean, obviously downtown is gonna be the economic core of the city, no matter what, uh, just, just the way we're built, but we can't just get um, uh, uh, blinders onto the rest of the city. Um, one thing I was, I was interested in is if there, um, I know when, um, uh, you know, businesses look at it, look at coming to Santa Rosa. Sometimes they interact with the city or some of our partners in in, um, uh, in uh, the real estate uh, the property owners. I, it, it, would it be possible to get sort of a, a recruitment um, uh, analysis done of like, hey, what are some of the things that we hear that they say like, oh yeah, we'd come here, but or we came here specifically because like we like this or we like that or. Um, I think, you know, when we're looking at our st strategic plan, it helps us kind of focus in on a few more things. I, I don't know if that's a, a possibility or. Yes, I think that's absolutely a pos uh, possibility. And I think what it dovetails into is our recruitment and retention strategies, mm -hmm. because the important piece is those things that cause people not to show up. What are those and what can mm -hmm. we do about those? Um, but then it's also celebrating your successes and really the good things about Sonoma County and Santa Rosa in general that attract businesses. So what you'll start seeing is as we, we identify potential incentives and we build out those programs, I think that pulls it into the conversation, links it back to the strap plan. But I think it's an incredibly important piece of the direction here in the next six months is to really define that and then have some really good conversations about what we think that's going to look like and where we can be aggressive, where we can't. Um, but that's really a big piece is having that strategy in place. And as I mentioned, I think it ties that together. Yeah, it's just one of those things like we don't know what we don't know, right? And if you look sort of like when businesses have an exit interview with an employee, like, why are you leaving here? What, what went wrong? And, you know, sometimes negative feedback is the best catalyst for change. So, um, yeah, thank you. And if I may share, yeah. um, on celebrating successes, I've got three shout outs. Um, First and foremost, Jill has done a yeoman's job of keeping the trains running on time. Um, we've asked her to step in in an area, while there is some overlap, isn't necessarily her area of expertise. Um, and she did a phenomenal job. 
And we are uh, fortunate that we're going to be able to continue to work with her. Um, she can focus more on rural property, but there is an intersection with economic development and the relationships that she has helped the city foster downtown, whether it be Simon, whether it be some of the business owners, um, attracting uh, different uh, developers and, and things of that nature. Uh, it's, it's critical to our economic development goals. So Jill, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I also want to shout out Gabe. Um, Gabe is, you all don't know, uh, but I've been in the trenches with him for some time now. Gabe wears a ton of hats. And on top of all of that, we asked him to run a department, right? A department that isn't solely focused on economic development. Um, and I couldn't ask for a, a better partner. Um, he's very much one of those people who um, you ask him to get something done. And even if it isn't his area of expertise or something that, that falls within his portfolio, uh, he finds a way to get it done. And, and this is a credit uh, to his leadership, right? We've got two, um, what do we call them? Top free agents that we were able to land <laughs> in Meredith and Scott. Um, and a lot of that is because of his vision, because of his leadership. And so I just want to publicly thank you for that leadership. Um, and then last but certainly not least, I've got to shout out Cadence. Right? So um, Cadence is the executive director of the Downtown Action Organization, but her role is so much more vast than just that. When we're talking about a South Town, for example, well, this is a, a partnership with Q Futuro Corporation in the city. So then you may ask, well, what is the DAO's role, right? Well, we wouldn't be where we are today had it not be for Cadence and the work that she continues to do. And so you've been a great partner, not only to me, but to the city. Uh, we very much look forward to continuing to work with you so we can transform downtown. Um, but to you three, this right here is the team, right? Um, and we are eager to hit the ground running uh, to implement this economic development shred plan. Um, and, and we will be coming to you all with more updates, but more importantly, with more action. So thank you. I love it. Thank you. I think that's a good uh, good end note, but let's see if there's any public comment. Thank you. Great, that we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. You're only allowed to come if you find the puns funny. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> finds the puns funny. <laughs>